In this module, we will discuss the types of epidemiologic studies and their strengths and weaknesses. We will also investigate common mistakes in epidemiologic studies. Let's start with a review of the types of epidemiologic studies. There are four general types. Each one has intrinsic quality because of their design, and each one is susceptible to study biases and confounding influences that can distort findings and produce errors. Perhaps 99% of radiation epidemiology studies are non-experimental and are called observational studies. In observational studies, you play the hand you're dealt. You must deal with factors often unknown that distort study findings and cause spurious or false results. These include bias in the design that cannot be controlled in the analysis and confounding factors such as cigarette smoking. Some studies are more susceptible to bias, such as the ecologic or correlation ones, and some are less susceptible, such as the cohort or follow-up ones. First in quality, but perhaps least informative, are experimental studies. There are few radiation experiments on humans, as you might imagine. Randomized clinical trials, however, are human experiments where patients are randomly assigned into radiation exposed groups and non-radiation exposed groups, and then evaluated for differences in cancer survival. Only in rare circumstances do they provide quantitative information on radiation health risks. They just aren't designed to do so. Cohort studies or follow-up studies usually have the highest intrinsic quality of the observational studies. You start with a population that's exposed and then follow them for the rest of their lives or as long as possible. You seek to determine what cancers or diseases they develop. Exposures and doses are determined before the cancers have occurred so they are least susceptible to many of the biases seen in other study designs. Concerns are selection bias as to who gets chosen for study, screening bias if the high dose subjects are more intensely screened for disease than the low dose subjects, ascertainment bias if large numbers are lost to follow up, and then confounding factors. Case control studies start with the disease and then the exposure is determined. For example, all mothers with children who died from cancer in a well-defined population, such as Great Britain, might be asked whether they received abdominal x-rays while pregnant. For each mother in the subject or case group, you find a mother of similar age when giving birth and in the same calendar period, living in the same locality, but whose child did not die. The control mother is asked the same question. For those who responded, and response rate is a concern, you compare the responses and interpret any differences that are found. This type of study is more susceptible to bias because results depend on who agrees to participate, memory recall, response bias, and other factors. In this example, the mothers of children who have died might be more reliable responders than control mothers of living children because of the traumatic event in their lives. Case control studies nested within cohort studies can be informative. However, there are few case control studies that are considered when making judgments as to the level or risk from low-dose radiation exposures. Now, the least informative type of epidemiologic study is the ecological or geographic correlation study. As the saying goes, correlation is not causation, and it is particularly true when you start with a correlation study. An example might be correlating lung cancer deaths with radon levels 
at the county level, where you don't know the radon home exposure for anyone, nor do you know how long he or she lived in the county. The numbers were large and negative correlations were reported. However, the findings were subsequently found to be biased by smoking status, which created these false results. My favorite correlation story is that back when the causes of lung cancer were not known, lung cancer deaths correlated much better with the sale of refrigerators than the sale of tobacco products. Ecological studies can be good for generating hypotheses, but not for testing hypotheses. That is, whether or not some exposures might possibly be causal. Ecological studies lack quality and are the most susceptible to bias. Since there are a lot of these studies in the literature, it's important to be able to separate the wheat of the cohort studies from the chaff of the ecological studies. Of course, no study is perfect. Radiological epidemiologic studies are primarily observational. We have to play the hand we're dealt. Observational studies are not experimental studies. There are always potential known and unknown biases that we try to minimize, as well as the confounding influences. These are potential sources of error that can distort the study findings no matter how much you try to avoid them. And there are intrinsic limitations to study design, as just mentioned. Not all studies are equal, and even the good designs can produce flawed findings. Another technique used by epidemiologists is called meta-analysis. For this type of analysis, you put together all the studies of a similar topic, such as all the underground uranium miners and other miners exposed to radon. You then look for common patterns and get better precision to estimate radiation risks and to evaluate possible interaction. Meta-analyses are generally considered as combining studies in the literature, whereas pooled analyses are stronger methodologically because the actual data for each study is obtained and a pooled analysis is conducted. There are problems, though, with meta-analyses and pooled analyses which hamper interpretation, particularly in radiation epidemiology. Results, for example, can be very dependent on what studies are included or not included. Some of the poorest studies can have the largest numbers and unduly influence the meta-analyses findings. Some high-quality but negative studies may be excluded. Some studies with negative findings are never published, and this is a form of publication bias. So care must be taken in interpreting meta-analyses of epidemiologic studies of radiation-exposed populations. Not surprisingly, epidemiologic studies are subject to inaccuracies and uncertainties. And for epidemiology, there are really three big causes of these errors. Chance, bias, and confounding. Let's discuss each in turn. Chance, by that I mean random variation. You can flip a penny 10 times over and over again, and one of those times you'll get 10 heads. In other words, sometimes chance alone produces results far away from normal or what might be expected. It just happens. Bias. Now, bias is a systematic error. You've done something or many things wrong in the study design or conduct. Once the study is done, there's nothing you can do to correct it. It's biased. For example, you used ultrasound imaging to screen for thyroid abnormalities, but you only screen the exposed group and not the non-exposed group. So you're going to get more thyroid abnormalities in the exposed people simply because the method of ascertaining or determining outcome was different. A recent example comes from the study of atomic bomb survivors. In the early years, autopsies were performed only 
on the high-dose survivors who died and not on the low-dose survivors who died. Until recently, the autopsy results from high-dose survivors were the only ones included in the cancer incidence evaluations and biased the findings to be more positive than they should have been. Confounding. Confounders are factors that you hope you can control in the design or analysis, but often can't because they are unknown. We control age at exposure, sex, calendar year, and try to control for socioeconomic status as a surrogate for smoking and other health and behavioral factors. But any differences by exposure level in, say, smoking histories can distort your results. Epidemiology tries its best to get a handle on confounding, but sometimes it's just not possible because the factors are unknown or unreliably reported. So you get erroneous results which lead to wrong interpretations. Then there are undue focuses on subgroup analyses and paper fuzziness, cherry picking if you will, and lack of clarity or transparency. When you're reading a paper and the interpretations and conclusions just don't seem right, it's probably because they aren't. Keep your antennae up and be skeptical. Authors can intentionally or unintentionally focus only on effects seen in a subgroup. For example, in men but not women, or on outcomes that were entirely unexpected and weren't a prior hypothesis and hadn't been observed in other studies. The byline becomes, despite the absence of an overall effect, we cannot discount the possibility that, now fill in the blank, cancer, is a possible low-dose effect. Or what occasionally happens is that negative findings are explained as positive after data manipulations are made. Be wary if the focus of the paper seems to be in making headlines and not scientific balance or understanding. What makes for a high quality study? A high quality study is one where the authors have minimized the potential for inaccuracies and accounted for uncertainties. The United Nations has just published a document on judging the quality of radiation studies which might be a good read. But in general, a high quality or reliable study is one that carefully selects participants, obtains high quality information on radiation exposure measurements, traces or follows subjects for long periods with few being lost to follow up, makes valid and accurate assessments of individual radiation exposures that lead to accurate estimates of radiation dose to organs or tissues. Validates outcomes of interest, such as cancer. Collects data on confounding factors to the extent possible so as to minimize the likelihood of distorting errors. Performs optimum statistical analyses. This, surprisingly, can be a concern when different types of analyses or different adjustment factors give meaningfully different results. Has a protocol that specifies the questions and study rationale in advance so that tangents are minimized. The authors don't highlight an unexpected or peculiar result that wasn't one of the questions trying to be answered has a study size as large as feasible to minimize the play of chance. Serious deficiencies in even a few of these points can move a reliable study into the unreliable or flawed category. Be skeptical, but then make your own assessment based on the information before you.